Hello chemists, welcome to lesson 63 in Le Chatelet's Principle. First, let's talk Le Chatelet's Principle. This states, a system at equilibrium stays at equilibrium unless acted upon by an outside force. Now, when a stress is applied to a system at equilibrium, the reaction will shift in a direction that relieves or removes the stress and thereby restores equilibrium, meaning the concentration of species will restore back to their equilibrium levels, essentially. Specifically, equilibrium will shift away from what's added and shift towards what's removed. As a result of Le Chatelet's principle, species on the side you go towards will increase in concentration because you produce those species, like products, when you go towards them, while species on the side you go away from decrease in concentration because you consume those species, like reactants, when you go away from them. Now, when equilibrium shifts to the right, the concentration of products in the forward direction will increase since you produce them like products as you go towards them. When equilibrium moves left, however, the concentration of reactants in the forward direction will rise because uh, you make them like products as you go towards them. Let's see this with the equilibrium reaction A on the left and equilibrium with B on the right. If A on the left is added here, equilibrium will shift to the right away from A so that the system can consume A as if A were a reactant and produce B as if B were a product. This lowers A's concentration back down to equilibrium levels. And as a result, moving right lowers A's concentration since you move away from it and consume it, while B's concentration increases since you move towards it and produce it. On the other hand, if A is removed, equilibrium will shift to the left towards A so it can produce A like a product and consume B as if B were a reactant. This raises A's concentration back up to equilibrium levels. And as a result, moving left lowers B's concentration since you move away from and consume it, while A's concentration rises since you move towards it and produce it. In short, when equilibrium shifts to the right away from A and towards B, the product B's concentration in this reaction in the forward direction will increase. However, when equilibrium shifts to the left, the reactant A's concentration in the forward direction for this reaction would increase. All right, how do we stress the system at equilibrium now? In four ways, we can change temperature, pressure slash volume, which are inversely related, concentration, or institute the common ion effect. Finally, note that when, with Lissot-Lay's principle, we usually evaluate gaseous systems and only focus on equilibrium systems or reactions. Let's first see how equilibrium systems respond to change pressure or volume. Pressure or volume only affect equilibrium systems with gases. Recall that gases are the most compressible state. Now, to explain how equilibrium responds to changes in pressure, let's discuss pressure's relation to number of particles. Remember, gas pressure results from gas particles hitting the container sides. Hence, more particles would lead to more particles potentially hitting a container sides, and that would result in greater pressure with more particles. All right, now, if you increase pressure or decrease volume, since they're inversely proportional, the pressure is too high. Since gas pressure is higher with more particles, the di disruption here is essentially too many particles. So to counter this, just do the opposite. Shift towards the side with less moles of gas. In other words, away from the side with more particles, so that you can bring the pressure down to equilibrium levels. If you lower pressure or raise volume, on the other hand, the problem is the pressure is too low. As gas pressure is lower with less particles, the disruption is too few particles, in other words. To counter this, do the opposite. Shift towards the side with more moles of gas to bring the pressure back up to equilibrium levels. All right? Um, before we review these problems, just to better understand this, when a lot of principal problem involves pressure, just find the number of moles of gas on each side so that you know which side has uh, less moles and more moles of gas. All right? So in example one here, first find the moles of gas on each side. On the left side, this equilibrium equation is 1 mole N2 gas plus 3 moles of H2 gas or 4 moles of gas. On the right side, this equation is 2 moles of NH3 gas plus heat, so it's just 2 moles of gas. Now, if we raise pressure, that relates to there being too many particles. So basically, you have to shift to the right to less moles of gas to bring the pressure down to equilibrium levels, since 2 moles of gas on the right are less. Since we move towards NH3 and heat when you shift to the right, their concentrations will rise since you produce these species like products when you go towards them. However, since we move away from H2 and N2 when you shift to the right, their concentrations will fall since you consume them like reactants when you go away from them. Now, if we lower pressure, that relates to too few particles, so we have to move to the left to more moles of gas to bring the pressure back up to equilibrium levels since four moles of gas on the left are greater. Since we move towards N2 and H2 when we move to the left, their concentrations will rise since you produce these species like products going towards them. However, since we move away from NH3 and heat when you move to the left, their amounts, on the other hand, will fall since you consume them like reactants when you go away from them. Okay? Example 2, we have 2 moles of CO2 gas on the left along with heat. And um, on the right side, we have 2 moles of CO gas plus 1 mole O2 gas or 3 moles of gas total on the right. So obviously we have two moles on the left, three moles on the right, right? So 
Um, if we lower pressure, the issue is too few moles of gas, so you have to move to the right to more moles of gas to bring the pressure back up to equilibrium levels, since three moles of the gas on the right are greater. Since we move towards CO gas and O2 gas when we move to the right, their concentrations will rise since we make these species like products when we go towards them. However, since we move away from CO2 gas and heat when shifting to the right, their amounts, on the other hand, will fall since you consume them like reactants when you go away from them. Finally, in example three, we have one mole of CO gas um, on the left and zero moles of, of gas on the right, since aqueous is not gas at all, obviously. Now, if we raise the pressure, the issue is too many moles of gas particles, right? So you have to move to the right to less moles of gas particles to bring the pressure back down to equilibrium levels since zero moles of gas on the right are less than one. Moving um, towards CO AQ on the right will raise CO AQ's concentration since you make this phase like a product when you go towards it. However, since we move away from CO gas um, when shifting to the right, CO gas's concentration will fall since you consume it like a reactant as you go away from it. Okay? Next, let's see how equilibrium systems respond to concentration changes. Adding a species or increasing a species concentration means there's too much of that species compared to its quantities at equilibrium. So equilibrium will shift away from that species added to consume it as if it were a reactant to bring its concentration down to equilibrium levels since the reaction, uh, sorry, since the system reacts to get rid of the added substance. Next, removing a species or decreasing a species concentration means there's too little of that species compared to its amount to equilibrium. So equilibrium will shift towards the species to removed to produce it as if it were a product to bring its concentration back up to equilibrium levels since the system reacts to replace the removed substance. In example 4, Cu2 plus Aq plus 2OH minus Aq on the left are in equilibrium with CuOH2 solid on the right. Here, increasing the concentration of OH minus means there's too much OH minus compared to its amounts of equilibrium. So equilibrium must shift away from the OH minus added, or obviously to the right side, to consume it as if it were a reactant and to bring its concentration back down to equilibrium levels, since the system reacts to get rid of the excess added OH minus. Moving away from the Cu2 plus Aq and OH minus Aq on the left when moving to the right will lower their concentrations since you consume them like reactants and lower their concentrations as you move away from them. On the other hand, moving towards CuOH2 solid when moving to the right will increase CuOH2 solid's concentration since you produce it like a product when you go towards it. All right? In example 5, CuH2O62 plus Aq plus 4 Cl minus Aq on the left are in equilibrium with CoCl4 2 minus Aq plus 6 H2O liquid on the right. Decreasing the concentration of CoH2O62 plus means there's too little CoH2O62 plus compared to its amounts at equilibrium. So equilibrium will shift towards the CoH2O62 plus removed or to the left towards the CoH2O62 plus removed to restore it or produce it as if it were a product and bring its concentration back up to equilibrium levels since the system reacts to replace whatever the removed substance is. Moving away from CoCl4 2 minus an H2O liquid on the right side when moving to the left will lower the, the concentrations of these two species on the right since you consume them like reactants as you move away from them. On the other hand, moving towards CoH2O62 plus and of course Cl minus when you shift to the left will increase these two species concentrations since you produce them like products when you go towards them. All right, finally in example six we have 2H2 gas plus O2 gas on the left in equilibrium with H2O liquid plus heat on the right. Here, adding H2 gas means there's too much H2 compared to equilibrium, so equilibrium shifts away from H2 gas to the right to consume it like a reactant and lower its concentration down at equilibrium levels. Moving away from H2 gas and O2 gas on the left as you shift to the right will lower their concentration since you consume them like reactants as you move away from them. Moving towards H2O gas and heat as you shift to the right, on the other hand, will raise their concentrations since you produce them like products when you move towards them. Next, for this example, removing H2O gas means too little H2O gas compared to equilibrium. So you have to shift equilibrium to the right towards H2O gas uh, that is removed um, so that you can restore H2O gas back up to equilibrium levels. Moving away from H2 gas and O2 gas on the left as you shift to the right will lower their concentrations since you consume these two like reactants as you move away from them. On the other hand, moving towards H2O gas and heat here, um, as you shift to the right, will raise their amounts since you produce them like products when you move towards them. Okay? And obviously, these four in the middle you can look over on your own. Next, let's see how equilibrium systems respond to temperature changes. Now, to explain how equilibrium systems respond to temperature changes, just note that heat being absorbed as a reactant or by starting substances means a shift in the endothermic direction away from the heat. 
so that the system can absorb or consume the excess heat and bring the heat back down to equilibrium levels. On the other hand, heat release as a product or a release by the ending substances means a shift in the exothermic direction towards the heat so that the system can release or produce heat and bring heat's heat back up to equilibrium levels. Basically, moving away from heat means you consume or absorb it like a reactant, meaning the endothermic direction, while moving towards heat means producing or releasing it like a product, or in other words, the exothermic direction. Okay? Now, increasing temperature means heat is added in excess of what's at equilibrium. So the system shifts in the endothermic direction away from the heat so as to absorb or consume this excess heat as you move away from it and bring the heat back down to equilibrium levels. Decreasing temperature, on the other hand, means heat is removed uh, and, uh, and those levels of heat are below those of equilibrium. So the system will shift in the exothermic direction towards the heat so as to release or produce heat as you move towards it and bring the heat back up to equilibrium levels. Okay, so example seven, we have one mole N2 gas plus three moles H2 gas on the left in equilibrium with two moles and H3 gas plus heat on the right. Now, raising temperature means an excess of heat here in terms of a disruption. So the reaction shifts in the endothermic direction, or in other words, to the left here, away from the heat, so as to absorb or consume the excess heat and bring the heat back down to equilibrium levels. Okay, so moving away from the 2NH3 gas plus heat on the right as you shift to the left will lower these two's amounts uh, since you uh, consume them like reactants moving away from them. On the other hand, moving towards N2 gas and H2 gas on the left as you shift to the left will raise their concentration since you produce them like products as you move towards them. Example 8, 1 mole C2H4 gas on the left is in equilibrium with uh, 2 moles C solid plus 2 moles of H2 gas plus uh, 52.4 kilojoules of heat on the right. So lowering temperature means a lack of heat, so the reaction shifts in the exothermic direction, or in this case to the right, towards the heat so as to release or produce heat and bring the heat back up to equilibrium levels. So moving away from C2H4 gas on the left as you shift away from it to the right will lower the quantity of C2H4 since you consume it like a reactant moving away from it. On the other hand, moving towards C solid plus H2 gas plus 32.4 kilojoules on the right will raise their amount since you produce them like products as you move towards them. Finally, in example 9, 2 moles H2 gas plus O2 gas on the left in equilibrium with 2 moles of H2O gas plus heat on the right. So here, lowering temperature means a lack of heat, so the reaction shifts in the exothermic direction to the right towards the heat um, to release or produce heat and bring heat back up to equilibrium levels. Here, as a result, moving away from the H2 gas and O2 gas on the left, as you shift to the right, will lower the quantities of H2 and O2 since you consume them like reactants. On the other hand, moving towards H2O gas and heat on the right will raise their quantity since you produce them like products. Now let's look at raising temperature. Raising temperature means an excess of heat, so the reaction shifts in the endothermic direction to the left, away from the heat, because it's too hot yet to move away from the heat. So uh, raising temperature again means an excess of heat. So the reaction shifts in the endothermic direction to the left away from the heat so that it can absorb the excess heat and bring the heat back down to equilibrium levels. So here you're shifting to the left to absorb the excess heat. Now moving away from the 2H2O gas plus heat on the right as you shift to the left will lower these two's quantities since you consume H2O gas and heat like reactants. While moving towards H2 gas and O2 gas on the left will raise their um, amounts uh, since you produce these two as if they were products. Okay, now let's discuss impacts of adding inert gases and catalysts. Adding an inert gas doesn't, that doesn't react will not shift equilibrium. That's because inert gases are non-reactive and won't change equilibrium because they have no impact on equilibrium if they don't react at all anyway. Adding a catalyst also does not produce a shift. This is because catalysts will work to speed up both the forward and reverse reactions equally in a way that the forward and reverse reaction sped up effects will cancel each other out. Hence, there's no effect on equilibrium when you add a catalyst. So in example 10, adding neon or argon gas would produce no shift as these inert gases are non-reactive and hence won't change the reaction. All right, adding a catalyst doesn't produce a shift either as a catalyst speeds up the forward and reverse reactions equally so that they cancel each other out and hence there's no impact on the reaction overall. Next, let's discuss the common ion effect. The common ion effect is this, and you may want to write down this part in blue because it will really help you understand it. For a reaction at equilibrium, adding an outside source of one of the ions already in solution, known as a common ion, will make the system shift away from that ion to consume it since there's an excess of the common ion upon adding the source. 
Hence, the reverse reaction is caused to happen at a faster rate, so as to reestablish equilibrium by consuming the common ion as if it were maybe like a reactant or something. All right, so example 11, we have NaCl solid on the left in equilibrium with the dissolved ion forms on the right in aqueous phase Na plus Aq and Cl minus Aq. If we add BaCl2 Aq here, the common ion produced here is Cl minus from BaCl2, um, which causes the system to shift to the left away from the Cl minus ion added so that it can be consumed and brought back down to equilibrium levels. Adding NaNO3, the common ion produced here is Na+, which causes the equilibrium to also shift to the left, moving away from the Na+, ion added to consume it and bring it back down to equilibrium levels. In both cases, moving away from Na+, or Cl- on the right side as you move to the left, will lower both of their concentrations, since you consume them like reactants, while on the other hand, moving towards NaCl solid on the left will increase its amount since you produce it like a product. Okay? Now, sometimes reactions involving ions specifically can go to completion, so please change this title, the title of this heading in your notes and change reactions in your notes to ionic reactions specifically because I made a bit of a, uh, I need to make a bit of an adjustment there. Specifically, an ionic reaction can go to completion if the products include either a gas, water, or a precipitate. One final thing to add is collision theory. Uh, specifically, the side you move away from uh, are considered the reactants in a sense, where effective collisions happen uh, as the reactants are consumed between particles to produce uh, products in the side you shift towards. All right, last, let's uh, relate collision theory to Le Chatelet's principle. Effective collisions happen between reactant particles to produce products regardless of direction. This means that if a disruption causes the equilibrium to move in a specific direction, effective collisions increase and happen more often on the side you move away from, since the side you move away from uh, has species consumed as if they were reactants. So in example 12, increasing temperature here would move equilibrium in the endothermic direction away from the heat to the right. So effective collisions would increase on the left side you go away from. In other words, that would mean more effective collisions between uh, C solid atoms and H2 molecules. In example 13, finally, increasing pressure moves equilibrium to the side with less moles of gas. Uh, in other words, to the right here. So effective collisions would increase on the left side you go away from. In other words, that would mean more effective collisions between the O2 gas and H2 gas molecules. All right, please review these practice problems on your own and email me any questions. Thanks. Bye-bye.